Good morning. How's it going? What's up? Good to be here with you all this morning. Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves. It's an excerpt from the poem, The Mustn'ts by Shel Silverstein. And we'll come back to that again at some point. So, about eight years ago, I gave a chapel talk when I felt like I had something really important to say, and I truly have not felt that way since. Over the last two weeks, uh, after Mr. Chapman asked me to speak to you all today, I've been struggling with something to talk about. My recent thoughts have been, I have no significant message, no takeaways for all of you, no lessons on how to live a moral and ethical life, nor do I think it's my place to explain to you why or why not you should do certain things a certain way, or how can I find something to talk about that will make you all feel that I'm really awesome. So, in recent days, I've walked around campus asking students what they wanted to hear about today. It has been a range of things, from talk to us about college counseling. No, no. Talk about why do we have Saturday classes, bro, and like that, why do we do it? It's so lame. Okay, no, no, I'm not going to talk about that today. And I had one student ask me, why don't you just tell a story about yourself? Okay, all right. So I can definitely do that, and that will be part of this. But after sitting with table nine last week at seated lunch on Thursday, and asking each of them what would be a good topic, something kept rising to the forefront. Posey, Pocholo, Abby, Harry, and Julian all thought it'd be a good idea to talk about stress. Who's stressed out? Why they're stressed out? How stressed out everyone is? And what to do about any of it? Okay, so let's give it a shot today. Even if this doesn't make any sense at all, I'm sorry, feel free to take what you want from it, and then we will be on our way to some good snacks. Sound good? Great, awesome. So, but let's start with a photo of a younger version of yourself, or myself, because that's kind of the way it goes, and whoa. Yeah, all right, all right. Easy over there. Okay, so, so, this photo was taken in May of 1994 uh, when I was a freshman in high school at Choate Rosemary Hall. Now, um, the music of the era was grunge. That's what was in, okay? Uh, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Nirvana, things of that nature. So it was really cool to, you know, act uh, all depressed even if you weren't and, you know, wear a flannel shirt and you know, pretend you're a garage band musician, and, um, but it, it, sometimes it doesn't really work out that way when you're a preppy kid, and you go to a prep school, so you button up your flannel, that hair's blow dried, and you're really confused. Like none of it really, you think you're hard and you're not. Like it just doesn't, just doesn't check out. So that is the 15 year old very confused version of myself, and yes, uh, my face is no longer that angular, the hair is gone and balding in the top right now, and uh, trimmed to a business appropriate, if you will. But other than that, not a whole lot has changed in me emotionally. And every time I look in the mirror, that's the same person I see. And while I truly didn't recognize it at the time, a conversation that occurred a few months prior to that picture being taken is when something changed and perhaps triggered uh, the birth of my own personal anxiety. So as a freshman at Joe Rosemary Hall during the second trimester, I was called into Dean Cook's office right when midterm grades were about to be released. Ah. How was I called in? I was in Mr. Stewart's world history class and another student walked in with a note and said, I have a note for Andy Campbell. Handed it to me and the shorthand read, see me, Mr. Cook. There were no emails, no texting someone, delivering a note to you so you can open it up in public and everyone believing you're in trouble is how you received news from faculty. That's just kind of how it went. So upon sitting down with Mr. Cook, who is honestly an amazing person, terrific, he informed me that in my Algebra I class, Mr. DeMarco had marked my grade down as an E for the midterm of the second trimester. An E, I asked? Yes, Andy, do you know what an E is? No, what's an E? It means that you're failing with effort. <laughs> failing with effort, I asked? Yes, it means that Mr. DeMarco is well aware that you are trying your hardest and doing your best, but you are still failing his course. Oh, well then, what's an F? 
An F is for those that really aren't trying very hard at all and are still failing the course. We don't give a whole lot of Fs, Andy, and actually we don't really give a whole lot of Es either. Oh, thanks, Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook went on to tell me that grades were going to be sent home in the mail within the next few days, and I, it was probably a good idea for me to tell my parents ahead of that. As I began to get visibly nervous and trembling, Mr. Cook, only with the best intentions, said this should not be a concern, or this should be a concern but don't let this consume you. It's really nothing to be stressed about. Okay, so that's a huge victory for me at 15. So my interpretation at the time was, my best isn't good enough, they know I'm trying, and in the end I failed, uh, but I'll do what he says, I'm not gonna worry about this. So to make a long story short, and leaving out a lot of details, the way I dealt with this was to try to not be stressed, because I didn't feel like I should be worried about it, nor did I want to show anybody that I was stressed out. So I didn't take care of things that I needed to take care of in that course and elsewhere. I was really, really social in high school. In those first two years, I just didn't do a whole lot of homework. and Didn't do them for 18 months straight. Mr. Cook was great, I'll give it to him. Any type of message that he tried to give me was supportive and he was just trying to help me out. He saw that I was nervous in the moment, and he was trying to comfort me, but I, my interpretation of the situ situation after that meeting was that I didn't want to act or show that it was a big deal to myself or anyone else for that matter. Considering where I was, and I was around so many strong academic students who seem like they can do everything so easily, if I showed signs of stress, I'm showing that I'm weak-minded, incapable, or just downright not very smart. I didn't want anyone to know that I was having trouble academically, and if I showed any signs or need of distress, people would know that I had a serious, serious issue, and they would probably think less of me. So I was internally bugged a little bit, and I wanted to do well, but I kind of figured this will just sort itself out. I'll do homework when I feel like it. You know, I'll just hang out all the time with my friends, and I'll only worry about sports, and that'll be good, and we'll just be fine. A year and a half later, the school advised my parents to make the decision to pull me out of Choate and to seek a school and a place where I would have more success. Thank you. And if my parents didn't do it voluntarily, the school was not going to invite me back for my junior year. And when I learned in the winter of 1995 on a phone call with my father that my family was going to pursue other school options for me, I would be leaving a place that I loved and I was starting over. And from that moment on, and for the last 30 years of my life, I have, a f I have found a way to be stressed or worried about something, anything, every single minute of every single day of my existence. That's when it started. Three more years of high school at Tabor Academy, four years at Middlebury College, my first job in a law firm, graduate school, getting married, a healthcare career, losing a job, starting over in my career, starting a family, Lake Forest College admissions, the Hotchkiss School for a year, and now 13 years at Brooks. So many highlights, so much to be grateful for and happy about, and I am very thankful for the life that I've had to date. I've been extremely lucky, but along the way, and still now, there's been a lot of confusion a ton of self-doubt, fears, concerns, and it takes me a minute every now and then to sit back and conceptualize and process that this is just kind of all part of the deal. It's just, it's just gonna be there. So if you're a Brooks faculty member, some of you might be thinking, time out, why is Andy Campbell giving a talk about stress? He is completely off his trolley every time he gets worked up. I see it all the time. Yes, and I, I hear that. I hear that. You know, Mr. Moshe will wonder every day how I can drink that much coffee and come by his classroom and just ramble and go about time and time again. Ms. Consoli and Ms. Kelly see me walking about in circles in the college office every day with my hand on my head like this and they're going, oh, here he goes again. If there was gonna be a vote amongst the faculty uh, of who is the most stressed out personality amongst us at Brooks, I, I would have a feeling I would not be su surprised if I was on some ballots. And um, honestly, that's fine, and I wear it, and I'm always gonna wear it. And I guess that's just kinda how I deal with it. I show it, and I don't know if that's right or wrong. I really don't. But that's how I go about it. I have control about what I'm doing, but a lot of times when there are things on my mind, I just talk about them and sometimes at nauseam, and talk about them to anyone, anybody who's willing to listen to me at all. 
So it's different for everybody, okay? There's so many ways to manage and deal with stress, whether it's mindfulness, playing your sport or your activity, whether it's performing on stage, whether it's just doing your work because you absolutely just have to get it done so you don't have to be stressed about it anymore. There are all sorts of ways to deal. No one way is better than the other, and it depends on who you are, really, it does. Okay, so what's the deal here, Campbell? What, what are you doing? What are you getting at exactly? Um, I, I don't know exactly, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, what I do know and what I have learned is that stress, anxiety, and all of those things that come with it are all natural. They're all real. They're all a part of you, every single one of you. And more often than not, it's not a negative thing. I don't know if managing my own stress is the right way for me. I still don't know. There's no playbook that came with it, that came with me. It just didn't happen. But I take ownership up ownership of it and I acknowledge that it is what it is and it actually could be a very positive thing in my life. It's not as unique to me as I once thought it could be. It's something that we all have going on and if you say you're not stressed or you never get stressed, I'm honestly not sure that I believe you. And perhaps at this stage in your life, acknowledging that your stress could be your strength is more difficult than it'll ever be. In reality, your emotions are never more real or true in your life than when you're a teenager. It's actually, it's, it's really, really cool. When you're older and you look back and you break it down, it's really fascinating the magnitude of realizing how every situation at this age, the gravity of it all and the depth of everything that comes up and how important it is. Every single experience at this time in your life seems so important all the time. And honestly, revel in it, revel in it. It's such a blessing that a lot, and maybe most of you feel this way right now. And you might not ever feel this strongly or true about anything again ever in your life. You might, but you really might not. When that test comes back and you think you did okay and you walked out of that room feeling confident and it comes back and it's not what you thought it was and it's a 67, 68, oh, the anguish in that moment. Um, and then you battle back, and you get some extra help. You meet with your teacher, and you come back, and the next time you sit down and you take that test and you smoke it to a 92, <clears throat> like how good does that feel? Like all of those feelings, you go from the depths of despair to the highest of highs. Um, it's really just, it's really magnificent. Um, it's great. When you're a teenager, if you have a crush on someone, it is so devastating. It's so devastating. When that person walks by, it's, I mean, it just the, the realest, truest emotion you can have. Any interaction or argument or fight with a friend that it feels in the, that moment that it will never end. It'll never end. You will never get back to that place where you were in your friendship. Most of the time you do, but at the time it feels like all of your walls are caving in on you all at once. That is the beauty, absolute beauty of this phase in your life that you're in right now and how important things are going on around you. Those feelings start to go away a little bit as you get older. They just do. And sometimes when you look back on it, even those moments, the times of heartache, the anguish, you miss how distinctive and critical they were at the time. You almost miss that pain. You miss that feeling. Now, I mean, other factors come along in life. You know, you worry about your own family. You worry about a job. You worry about money. You worry about your livelihood. There will always be anxieties. There will always be things about you that you have to deal with, that you have to worry about, that are going to cause you mild trauma, if you will. So again, I'm not here to tell you how you personally should manage any of it, because as adults, we try to do that a lot at times when working with students. We try to fix things, easy to fix things, just so we can go about our day and we don't have to worry about it with you. And we'll say to you, don't worry about it. Don't let it get to you. Don't worry about what people think. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Don't worry about what people think. Conversely, if you actually do stress a little, you do worry a little, let it get to you a little bit. And maybe if you are a little bit concerned about what people think and how they feel about things, maybe you're adding to your growth as a human being. If you let something get to you, what does that mean? It means that you care about it. It means that it's important to you. Things should be important to you. Everyone should have things that are important to them, whether it's academics, playing time, game situations, interactions with parents and family. You should have things that are important to you and a set of values and expectations for yourself. If you don't let things get to you, or ignore it, or block it out, then it might become a bigger problem. 
it might manifest into a bigger deal that can impede your progress in certain areas of life as it did to me when I was 15 years old. If it's on your mind, it adds concern or stress, then you are addressing an important aspect of your life, whether you realize it in the moment or not. The idea of don't care what people think for certain things, I guess, but generally speaking, you should care. If you care what people think through social interactions, through performing your best, through being kind to others, does that make you a more appealing person to be around? 100%. If you care about what people think, are you generally nicer to other people? Yeah. You just are, and that's great. So we just passed the midterm for the first semester. First of all, congratulations. That's awesome. It's a long stress between the week after Labor Day and the Thanksgiving holiday. You're in a groove now, and the Thanksgiving will be here before you know it. You've already made a huge dent in this year's school year. But with the midterm coming and going, yeah, that adds a little bit when you get grades and marks and have to have conversations about them. But you've got this. You do. You've got it. As I mentioned, I'm not sure if there are any takeaways from this. And yeah, I tend to ramble, and that just happened again. My apologies. But if you're feeling a little extra, something is on your mind, you are carrying some emotional weight, embrace it. Completely embrace it. Celebrate the fun and the carefree moments. But embrace, soak up, and soak in the reality of the tougher times, too. Know that you're not alone. Don't fight it. Feel it. To complete that poem, listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Thanks very much. Have a good one.